a very warm welcome to everybody on this cold, dark <laughs> evening. Um, some of you may not know me, so I'll introduce myself first. My name is Monica Bomducci, and I'm the initiator and later the director of the Insiders Outsiders Festival. If you want to know about the festival itself, just simply look at the website www.insidersoutsidersfestival.org. And I will say straight away, well, actually, all sorts of things, but, but one of the delights about working on this festival, which was, as many of you will know, designed to pay tribute to the immense cultural contribution of those who came to this country from Nazi-dominated Europe, has been to discover unfamiliar, unknown, neglected figures, and perhaps no one more so for all sorts of reasons, which I'm sure our speaker today will elaborate on, than Johannes Matthäus Kölz. So it's been a great pleasure, you know, for me to sort of trace or track uh, Simon's sort of progress, the sort of process of finding, you know, sort of more and more out about this remarkable and very unknown, fascinating, as you'll see, absolutely fascinating figure. And I'd also like to add to that, that the fact that he wasn't Jewish, but had to leave is, I think, a salutary reminder for many of us, particularly those of us who are indeed descended from Jewish refugees, that of course, for obvious reasons, by force of, us, of uh, historical circumstances, most of the refugees were Jewish, but they were the brave ones, the anti-fascists for one reason or another, and as I say, you'll hear much more about where cult stands in relation to that, who also had to find sanctuary, ultimately, in this country. So I think that's really important. Um, I will say a little bit by way of introduction about Simon, if I may. Um, Simon was born in Gloucester and grew up in Dorset. Um, he studied art and art history at Manchester College of Art and went on to study at postgraduate level in fine art conservation and later an MA in museum studies. In 2005, he became the fine art curator at Leicester Museum Service, which has, as some of you will know, and if you don't know, you really ought to know, has really the best collection of German expressionist art in this country. And I'm not accepting you know, the taint from that, from that statement. And I will just add there, Simon, if I may, that Simon wrote the very, very interesting um, essay about that collection in the Insiders Outsiders Companion volume, which focuses on the visual arts. Uh, so I would urge you to, to, to look at that if you don't already know about the book. And I will also just add that the whole history of how Leicester, of all places, without any disrespect to Leicester, came to have this extraordinary collection of early 20th century German art, is very intimately tied up with the story of one German Jewish, very eminent sort of art collecting family. So it all, all comes together. Um, he left Leicester Museum um, not so very long ago in 2019, and he's become an independent museum curator. And this year he's published his first book, and I don't have to tell you what that is, the title is there on the screen in front of you, uh, which of course is the subject of this evening's presentation. So apart from saying please, yes, everybody mute yourselves to avoid any interference, and also when it comes to asking questions, and I do hope there will be plenty afterwards in the wake of Simon's talk, please type them in in the first instance into the chat function, which many of you are familiar with by now, I'm sure, at the sort of bottom center of the screen, and then I will field them. To, to Simon as, a, as appropriate. So without further ado, Simon, over, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Monica, for inviting me to give uh, this evening's talk. Now, I hope that everyone can hear my voice fairly clearly. Um, I'm new to Zoom and the, the various controls that um, govern it, and I've adjusted my microphone settings, so I do hope that you can hear me. It's fine. Um, Thanks very much, Monica, for that uh, introduction and for inviting me to join the Insiders Outsiders online program. Um, German artist Johannes Matthias Kultz is the subject of uh, my new book. Um, he's a little known artist. Um, the exhibition at Leicester Museums in 2001 helped to bring him to a new audience. Um, but his story um, remains um, relatively unknown. So hopefully my book and um, its introduction to the story and uh, its opening out of the narrative will welcome new audiences to his story. Born in uh, Mühldorf, Bavaria, into a Catholic merchant family in 1895, Matthias Kultz's story is, is a life divided, you might say, a story of disruption, dislocation and displacement, but also hope and achievement too. 
Acknowledgement must go to Eva Farrington, born Eva Maria, the daughter of Matthias Kultz, who has shown unwavering determination in rediscovering and preserving her father's artistic legacy. His death in 1971 prompted her to begin uh, a search for um, missing pieces of his wonderful uh, triptych, Thou Shalt Not Kill. And in July 1998, uh, Ava approached uh, Leicester Museums with a remarkable offer. She wished to uh, offer uh, surviving pieces in her possession of this once magnificent work of art. Now this, of course, is, is where um, my button on my laptop should instantly go to the, the next um, uh, image, which uh, for some reason it's, it's, it's not doing. Um, so uh, just for the moment, um, these uh, four fragments, um, very importantly, uh, entered the Leicester collection and now form uh, a very important element in terms of uh, this wonderful story for that collection. Let's just see if we can activate the, um, the, the PowerPoint for, for a second. Simon, if I can just interrupt, if it's frozen, I suggest you exit the full screen and kind of start again. Just, okay. just do it slowly. Um, right. At least people can now see properly what you look like. <laughs> Just do exactly what you did before, and that hopefully. Yeah. Okay, can everyone hear me and see this? Not yet. We can see you and hear okay. you, but not the images. Right, okay. Apologies, everyone. We did test this, of course, before, and then it seemed to be fine. But uh, the blessings of Zoom, alas. You should be able to just repeat the process. So apologies, everyone. Do do bear with me just for a moment while this um, this uh, we we hope to try and uh, resolve this um, technical hitch. What's the problem, Simon? Do you, do you want to try and describe it to me? Well, moment. Um, I can get to um, the beginning and start the slide, but when I attempt to operate uh, um, and move from one slide, from one image to the next, it seems to want to freeze for some yes. reason. I mean, you haven't actually shared it yet. On you have you have you clicked on share screen? You need to go back to that original function. Yeah. Okay, that looks promising. Yes, okay, so now maximize the image and hopefully it'll be fine now. Need to go back to the beginning. Yeah. Um. Okay. 
Okay, and now hopefully that's it. Okay. Okay, so this is the self-portrait from uh, 1943 of Johannes Kurtz when he was in the Pioneer Corps, and this now forms part of the Leicester collection. And the offer that Ava made, Ava Farrington, who changed her name from Eva Maria to Ava uh, once she reached this country in the late 40s. Um, the offer comprised the fragments that you see of the once huge um, masterpiece, uh, Thou Shalt Not Kill. Its overall dimensions, when complete, were 2.5 uh, metres in height by just over six metres in width. So a considerable um, undertaking. Uh, a triptych uh, painted on three panels on heavy wooden blockboard uh, panels. All the fragments bore um, saw cuts um, along their edges and apart from some abrasions and minor paint losses they were in surprisingly good uh, condition. Um, so these fragments that you see um, uh, were part of this, this wonderful uh, painting. So who was Johannes Kultz? Who was this man who created um, this incredible work? We know that he was born on March the 31st, 1895 in Muldorf, Bavaria, the first son of Johann Kultz, a merchant, and his wife Maria. Um, brothers Hans and Sebastian and sisters uh, Lizzie, Rosie and Maria completed the family. Uh, Kultz's early childhood appears to be uh, happy. Here he is on the left, um, a childhood photograph standing slightly protectively in front of his younger brother Hans. Kultz's father uh, purchased a small shop in Munich and with the family move uh, the boy started school there um, and when he wasn't uh, studying he enjoyed uh, climbing in the hills, tobogganing in the snow and helping out with the harvests. After school and finishing his exams, he went on to work at the glassworks of Zettler's, uh, where he learned business management and the art of painting on glass. But by now, uh, aged uh, 18, 19, his plans for a possible future artistic career, he'd applied for and gained a place at the Munich Academy of Fine Arts, were about to be sidelined in the most devastating and dramatic uh, fashion. Uh, of course, this was the, uh, the outbreak of the First World War. Um, the catastrophe, of course, which has been uh, recently the subject of the centenary and has been documented uh, hugely elsewhere. Artists um, were uh, experimenting at this time with revolutionary forms of art, such as abstraction, Kandinsky, and Ludwig Meidner, who is an important Jewish artist and um, included in the Leicester collections was producing a sequence, a series of artworks known as uh, the Apocalyptic Visions, painted in 1913, which seemed to be an uncanny portent of the violence and destruction to come. This is um, Apocalyptic Vision from 1913, simply titled, and it shows writhing figures in a sea of mud. Um, there's a collapsed a building in the background, and an eclipsed sun. Uh, a jet of steam or perhaps an explosion um, is in the background. So again, a very disturbing, energetic and deeply expressionist uh, image. The kind of example of work which was produced by artists, intellectuals and writers responding to the build-up, the, the tensions in urban society, the, uh, the sabre rattling, the rapid industrialization and the, um, the shifting of alliances and power just before the outbreak of war. Hans was among the first to be sent to the war, um, uh, sent to the front on August the 3rd, 1914. He was tragically killed the following month by uh, an enemy sniper's bullet and he kept um, a diary in a battered green exercise book, a testament to his circumstances from a young man eagerly perhaps approaching conflict to very, very quickly in just a few short weeks to a wary combatant um, looking almost over his shoulder um, at the possibility of death at any time. So uh, incredibly frightening. 
after his death, Kurtz himself was devastated. Just before news reached the family, Kurtz had sent a postcard to Hans simply saying, are you still alive? Do you still live? So his death was um, a mortal blow to Kurtz, um, who very shortly afterwards was drawn into the conflict and um, uh, enlisted um, into the army. Here he is, um, two photographs of Kurtz, uh, one on the left from around 1916 in officer's uniform, and on the right, um, a detail from a larger photograph, again from around the same time, uh, showing Kurtz marching as a young Unteroffizier um, at the head of his platoon. In his later diaries and accounts, he wrote of the, the, the carnage and the destruction of um, officers and NCOs being so efficient that very, very quickly he found himself promoted to uh, captain. So again, um, just a sign of the, the horrors of war and the brutal efficiency of the mechanized destruction in the trenches. One of the key offensives of World War I in which Kurtz was involved was the German assault on the French town of Verdun, uh, particularly focused on the polygon concrete fortress, the mighty fortress of Douaumont. Uh, Douaumont was considered impregnable by the French army. They felt it could never be captured. <clears throat> And so uh, the German army threw all their resources uh, at capturing uh, one of a number of concrete forts surrounding Verdun and a key strategic objective. Um, both sides uh, wrote of the, the, the terror of continuous shelling, which was um, necessary and attempted to try and break through um, the mighty concrete structure. Uh, and it cost uh, uh, in total almost a million German and French casualties, dead, wounded or missing in action uh, in the titanic struggle, um, first to capture the fortress and then the French army to recapture it. Um, one frightening episode saw Kurtz and four of the soldiers buried alive in mud and rubble after a, a particularly uh, nasty explosion of a shell nearby. Three of them were killed but Kurtz and a fellow corporal uh, managed to dig their way out of the, um, out of the rubble and Kurtz dragged uh, his wounded comrade, severely wounded comrade, uh, to safety. And for this, he was awarded the Iron Cross uh, second class. The Great War ended on November the 11th, 1918, and Kurtz uh, saw the end of his active service and was placed into the Army Reserve, uh, retaining the rank of captain. In 2001, his son Siegfried, always known as Fred, uh, wrote about what he felt was his dad's almost fixation um, about the way that ordinary people paid for the stupidity and nationalism and the horrors of war and the conspiracy of church and state which came together to send young men to fight and die on, on the front. So Armistice Day, 11th of November, for millions it was a time of celebration, but of course for Germany the bitterness of defeat. Um, in November 1918, the Weimar Republic was born in a spirit of democratic revolution, um, but amid factional clashes and violent political infighting. Um, attempts at revolution were put down by uh, the Freikorps and um, among these units uh, would later emerge Hitler's stormtroops. After demobilization, Kurtz entered the, Mu the Munich police force in 1919 and at the same time realized his dream of enrolling at the Munich Academy of Fine Art as a part-time student. His attendance card for the academy shows him um, in attendance part-time from 1919 to 1929 uh, under professors Franz von Stuck and Olaf Gorbranson. Kurtz excelled here, becoming um, a Meisterschüler, uh, a master student um, with his own studio and key, um, important when he was attempting to juggle police shifts um, with his attempts to uh, gain as much time as possible uh, in the art college environment. But he was also a skilled 
um, war veteran. Um, he'd entered the police, but he was actually selected to be an instructor in unarmed combat and went for a while, 1921-22, uh, to the Spandau Police Training School. And here he is demonstrating unarmed combat um, uh, with a, a fellow officer uh, student, uh, Kultz, um, who Ava Farrington always described, as soon as the sun came out, he blossomed and tanned to a crisp. So you can see um, he's, he's got a, an athletic body and tanned skin. Um, and again, very almost taciturn, very quiet throughout his life, but uh, nonetheless able to summon a variety of skills when the need arose. Of course, avant-garde art flourished and there were a number of influences um, which Kurtz would have seen, would have been aware of in um, post-war Germany, in Weimar Germany. Um, he saw the harsh um, uh, realism and anti-utopianism uh, observational of the Neue Sachlichkeit artists. Um, he would have also seen expressionists, um, the pre-war utopian um, expression of the deepest emotion, the artists like schmidt Rotluff. Kirchner, Heckel and Nolder um, put forward in their work. Um, artists uh, in New Objectivity also expressed withering social comment, often for publication. Uh, the particular key names here are George Gross and Otto Dix, who had fought in the First World War as a machine gunner and um, uh, brought out his, his uh, withering bitterness and satirical potency in um, artworks such as this one, uh, The Trench, painted in 1923, which caused an absolute furore when it was exhibited um, <clears throat> and purchased by uh, the Valraff uh, Museum. Um, eventually the curator there was forced to resign. Um, for um, most audiences, the subject matter that Dix had depicted was horrific. Um, in the aftermath, aftermath of shelling, um, a trench position, eviscerated corpses um, litter the scene. Uh, there's a body which has been impaled on trench steel palings, um, and there are various bodies in states of decay or dismemberment which litter the scene. Unfortunately, um, in uh, the late 30s, the painting was lost and now is assumed to be destroyed. Um, but it went on exhibition and uh, it came to Munich in 1926 where Kultz um, is most likely would have seen it because of the accompanying uh, press coverage and uh, the many visitors who would have been um, uh, determined to see it, such was its notoriety. So works like this, um, whilst Kultz perhaps was destined to pursue um, perhaps arguably a more aesthetically conservative style, he nonetheless would have absorbed um, the, the powerful and potent narratives of works like this when it came to the, um, the conception and painting of his uh, triptych, Thou Shalt Not Kill. So whilst in sympathy with many of the views of the avant-garde, um, Kurtz began to be drawn to a different means of expression, the naturalistic depiction of reality. And um, one of the paintings which um, he'd seen and made such a lasting impression upon him was by Wilhelm Leibel, um, who was a 19th century artist who focused on the rural communities um, around Munich. And he spent time uh, painting portraits and studies of um, rural working communities. And this uh, oil painting, which took him three years uh, from 1882, is Three Women in Church. And Kurtz would later cite um, the example of libel as one of the key artists who shaped it, or began to shape his thinking at this time. So the three women um, uh, are dressed in their Sunday best and are deeply pious as they focus on um, their prayer books, seated in a pew in church. So again, this very important um, panel painting was uh, one that Kurtz was drawn to and began to give the flavour of the work that he would subsequently produce. 
Now in 1923, um, <clears throat> the fledgling Weimar Republic was beginning to be in serious trouble. The wartime reparations, which the Allies insisted Germany pay, had left its economy almost in ruins. Um, there were few queues, galloping inflation, and a certain right-wing uh, demagogue um, who joined the National Socialist Party, Adolf Hitler, felt that the time had come to uh, take action and to somehow um, slice through uh, the, the weakness that he perceived um, represented the new Weimar Republic. So um, he staged the, the Munich Beer Hall Putsch, um, uh, which Kurtz in fact was involved in. Um, amazingly, Kurtz uh, exchanged gunfire between Hitler and his marchers in November 1923. He was in um, a detachment of police which had blocked one of the streets uh, leading to um, the uh, the Odeonsplatz, which was the, the the site of the Feldenhalle, the Hall of the Field Marshals. This was um, a well-known landmark where Hitler wanted to um, get to in order to give a rousing speech uh, drawing people to his cause, but he was thwarted and uh, after the exchange of gunfire, um, 16 uh, marchers and soldiers lay uh, dead or dying. Here are some of Hitler's stormtroops gathering on one of the uh, other squares just prior to um, uh, their main command to be received from Hitler, which was to take over key buildings around the city, provided the police and the Reichswehr, the state guard units, did not oppose them. Of course, the, the, the putsch was foiled. Uh, Hitler was arrested, um, placed on trial, well publicized for his extreme views. He was sentenced um, to five years, but released after only nine months. And of course, the story is well known. He was imprisoned in Landsberg prison where he wrote Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Um, because of his role in the Hitler putsch, Kurtz began to uh, fear a knock on the door from Hitler's stormtroops and um, of course Hitler um, after becoming Chancellor uh, quickly consolidated his powers and began to look for um, uh, people who had perhaps wronged him perhaps had had been his enemies and so Kurtz felt very frightened he could possibly be among uh, among this this um, uh, contingent so in 1924, Kurtz resigned from the police um, soon after this putsch event. Um, and his police record simply states nervous stability and unsuitability for future duties. So perhaps Kurtz literally dodged a bullet in, in this way through leaving the police. But also at the same time, in, in just before 1924, in 1922, he'd met um, a young lady called uh, called Clara, Clara Troy, who came from a prosperous middle class family and who had married um, uh, Joseph Fritz, an engineer who'd served in the Great War. So here she is from about um, uh, 1912. Uh, she would have been about 16, 17 in the photograph that you see on the left. On the right, uh, she's seated in her parents' Mercedes, again from about this, a similar time. And she's the, the figure on the, the far right, in, uh, seated in the back of the vehicle. They began an affair, which developed into a relationship, ultima ultimately which would cost Claire her marriage. But they moved out of Munich. Kurtz had moved away from his police barracks, and they found a small cottage in um, a Bavarian forest district, a forest woodland village called Hohenbrunn, about seven miles uh, southeast of Munich. This was where they set up home, and this was where Kurtz began to consolidate his fledgling painting career. Um, he began painting mostly on wooden supports, which were freely and cheaply available as a source of um, supply, fuel, but also in Kurtz's case, artistic supports from the forest sawmills, which dotted the districts uh, to the south of Munich. In 1923, uh, they had a son, Siegfried, later known simply as Fred. 
and um, in 1929, Kultz um, completed his studies, winning um, a travel scholarship, um, which he enabled him to travel to, uh, to Paris, to Florence and other places, sometimes accompanied by Claire. Claire, it should be said, um, had an independent allowance. Even though her, um, her marriage ended in divorce, um, she retained this allowance from her father. Um, so this kept them um, in at least a, a modicum of, of comfortable circumstances for, for a while. Uh, one of the early paintings which Quilts um, uh, had sold to uh, the Alpenverein Museum, initially in Munich, which transferred later to Innsbruck, was this uh, large four and a half feet square canvas called uh, Karwendelspitz. Uh, dated from 1929. So it shows the influence of Caspar David Friedrich and uh, a splendid Gothic uh, tree which has had its trunk split by lightning and a moody sky and mist rising from the mountains, establishing quilts as um, a powerful uh, realist painter. So there's, there's a uh, noted and acknowledged influence from uh, Friedrich. So he's still finding his way, but it's a powerful early uh, canvas from uh, this young artist. In turn, the first of a number of uh, commissions began to come to help Quilts on his way from um, a publisher called Heinrich Berg, who had a small publishing outlet in the village of Gauting, uh, one of a number of villages south of Munich, on the way towards the Austrian border. And uh, the title of the book, which was published in 1932, and for which Kurtz was commissioned to do 16 illustrations, was Johannes Ull. And it was golden words in support of the, the work of our priests, our Catholic priests. Kurtz had painted scenes in the working life of a priest, and this particular example shows um, the guns stilled on the war front. Uh, soldiers are kneeling as a priest gives communion um, in a snow-covered forest clearing. Now, if you look to the far left of the kneeling figures, you can see one figure wearing glasses. It's hopefully reasonably visible. This is believed to be Johannes Kurtz, Matthias Kurtz, who's incorporated himself in a little portrait in this, uh, in this group setting. So it's believed it links directly to some of the experiences um, he'd seen and witnessed uh, during wartime. He was also asked to paint uh, a portrait. This is from 1936, a little later. The, uh, the, the Weihbischof, or, or suffragan bishop, didn't have his own cathedral, didn't have his own particular setting, but was, was um, peripatetic, uh, Anton Scharnagel. So it's a splendid uh, realist portrait showing the ecclesiastical uh, vestments, the, the mitre, and a splendid clasp which holds everything together. So um, uh, Birgit uh, Weidinger, who would later write in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, on the discovery of the triptych fragments in the Kurt story, um, Anton Scharnagel was her great uncle. So when she came to the Leicester Museum um, in the early 2000s, she saw this photograph and she instantly said, it's Uncle Anton. And no one realized who he was fully until that, that point. So she told the museum a little bit about his story. So it's, it was a nice and lovely link to enliven this particular portrait which sadly is believed lost, destroyed in, in uh, World War II. So sadly, this black and white photograph is all that remains. So Colt's beginning to um, catch the attention of the art world, uh, patrons and buyers interested in his work. Another 36 still life, um, Bavarian jug, uh, fruits and vegetables, um, this was purchased by the Lembach House uh, in Munich and uh, remains part of its collection today. Um, so a wonderful country um, uh, wine jug um, forms part of the, the composition. Uh, and there's a beautiful play on light, the reflection on 
the glass and, and the study of the different textures of fruits and vegetables. Um, and a rather pugnacious, strange looking object in the bottom right foreground, it's a celeriac with, with um, rather ugly, um, but very striking twisting roots. So again, Kurtz perhaps absorbing some of the, the tenets of new objectivity, um, <clears throat> a rather pugnacious, but um, uh, distant uh, observation of everyday life. And a brief bit of um, uh, uh, present day manufacture in, in the two um, foil wrapped um, squares of butter just behind the jug. So a wonderful early and detailed still life from Kurtz. Now, um, Kurtz produced this strange, unusual and striking uh, pencil sketch portrait in 1936 of Hitler. Why did he do this? Um, possibly um, it was an awareness that um, in a changing market uh, governed by uh, dark fascist forces, it could possibly be um, circumspect to be able to produce a portrait of Hitler from your portfolio if circumstances demanded. But in fact, the link was probably down to the efforts of um, Heinrich Berg, who probably in his, his working offices uh, necessarily had to be a member of the Nazi party and would have been aware of, of certain customers who may have purchased from him. Of course, this was the mid 1930s, where it was almost impossible to undertake any meaningful um, cultural work such as publishing or painting, um, unless you were a member of one of the, uh, one of the chambers um, of culture set up by Goebbels. So without delving too deeply, it's, it's more than likely that Berg himself, Kurtz's friend and publisher who had given him early commissions, um, was perhaps a member of the Nazi party, it's not known. Um, but a, a link would emerge as to why the portrait was produced a little later in um, uh, August 19, uh, 1937. Um, but one important element um, was uh, the fact that uh, Kurtz in uh, 1933, uh, uh, um, just before this portrait was produced, had actually had to leave uh, Germany for, for two years. Um, I'd spoken briefly previously of Hitler um, gaining power in 1933 um, and quickly um, uh, launching the Enabling Act, um, which through government um, uh, brokered or brooked no opposition to new um, dangerous laws which sought to suppress all uh, non-Nazi opposition. Um, so Kurtz left uh, Germany and fled to Yugoslavia. Um, he lived for two years with his family on a farm in Kon Konjice. And this was where he consolidated work on the triptych, Thou shalt not kill. The triptych had been hidden um, from prying eyes when um, it was moved to Yugoslavia, but Berg had interceded on behalf of his friend and um, the, the authorities who had proclaimed um, Kurtz, an involuntary emigrant and were threatening to seize property and assets, um, relented and <clears throat> Berg was able to persuade them to allow Kurtz and his family to return to, uh, to Waldeck, the little cottage where they'd been living um, in Hohenbrunn. So uh, the family had become exiles between 1933 and 35, and shortly afterwards, 1936 was when this sketch of Hitler uh, was produced in connection with um, uh, a forthcoming, uh, an amazing uh, commission, um, which I'm just about to come to. In August 1937, um, a meeting took place at Kurtz's cottage. Um, Heinrich Berg brought along Gauleiter regional party leader um, Adolf Wagner and uh, Wagner outlined um, uh, a commission which uh, 
for Kurtz was to be invited to paint uh, the portrait of Hitler in a direct face-to-face -face sitting with the Fuhrer himself. This would have been eight sittings with Kurtz um, having to agree to one important condition. Now this was uh, to wear the Nazi stormtrooper uniform and uh, Berg had even brought um, a shirt uh, for Kurtz to try on in the boot of his car. So Kurtz was appalled at this um, and in, in his later diaries um, he recorded that he was appalled by the flippant and arrogant approach and he just couldn't see himself, a university graduate, captain in the First World War, um, becoming disguised as a private of the SA, identifying himself visibly and publicly with a crowd of adolescent hooligans. So he refused this commission um, to what must have been the horror of Berg and the displeasure of Wagner. Um, they would have found somebody else to produce the portrait, but Kurtz was the first to be invited to uh, produce this portrait, which would have been the colour title illustration for a Christmas book of uh, the achievements of um, the National Socialists at Christmas uh, 1937. So Kurtz turned down this commission um, very, uh, very ominously. Uh, led to circumstances which would change his life. He had begun work in relative secrecy um, in or around 1930-31 on this gigantic work which was Thou Shalt Not Kill and um, you've seen at the outset of the talk uh, some of the fragments which survive from this uh, once huge work measuring uh, just over six meters, almost 20 feet across in width and almost eight feet high and in three panels on heavy uh, wooden, wooden block board. Kurtz had envisioned a modern day um, version or uh, vision of a medieval altarpiece. Instead of uh, saints flanking on either side of the wings, a center panel showing Christ enthroned, um, he'd had a much more darker, um, horrific vision, uh, bringing to bear his experiences in the First World War um, and dra drawing on the example of Otto Dix, George Gross, and the medieval work of um, artists like, uh, like Dürer um, and the, um, the amazing uh, 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 triptychs and prints and engravings um, which showed uh, a visceral telling of biblical stories and the endless um, conflict between faith and uh, demons, the devils, the kind of horrors of the medieval bestiary which flopped these engravings. So Kurtz's vision, uh, as you can see, um, brought to bear um, his experiences in a modern age. The left-hand panel uh, shows families uh, united in prayer, um, German soldiers uh, holding rifles and with massed bayonets. On the right, you see the allied soldiers, um, a black soldier with uh, a rose in his mouth, possibly a member of the uh, colonial uh, forces which fought on the French side. Uh, in the center of the group of three, um, an English Tommy, uh, followed by uh, a French uh, poilu and the two figures, a young woman and a boy on the bottom right corner um, were Kurtz's own uh, children, um, his stepdaughter Siglinda um, from uh, Clara, Claire's first marriage and uh, their son Fred, aged here um, about 10 years old, um, all united in prayer and around them uh, flowers, insects, painted in beautiful jewel detail and in colour. Here you can see some detail uh, photographs which uh, Claire was instrumental in arranging uh, photographic sessions uh, during 1931-32 um, uh, before the, um, the triptych was taken out of Germany and the family made their first departure uh, into exile. Um, 
On the lower left, you can see one of the, one of the uh, two surviving fragments, six in all, four fragments here in the UK in Leicester, two fragments still owned in private collections in Germany. So on the lower left, um, uh, a baby boy um, with a wonderful uh, translucent and radiant white skin. Um, on the right, a fragment which would have originally joined just next to the right hand edge of, of the baby, um, beautiful flowers. Daisies, gentians, dandelions and poppies and um, butterflies resting on the flowers as symbols of resurrection. Um, so again, beautifully detailed and assured painterly passages throughout uh, this triptych. Again, these colour fragments give just a, a, a sense of what once was um, uh, a painting of immense compassion, radiating uh, a deep spirituality, following cycles of family and faith that Kurtz had had, and drawing on his experiences in the First World War in the centre panel, um, which was the most disturbing of all, of a crucified uh, German gas masked soldier. Um, originally, Kurtz's concept was um, an unholy trinity. Um, because this photograph was taken at an early point in the, the triptych's um, completion, um, you can see that it's, it's unfinished. So the bottom part of the crucified German soldier is incomplete, as is the bottom left hand corner. Um, we know from later research that the surviving fragment of a dead German soldier uh, with a worm coming out of his decayed um, fleshless eye socket, which you can see in colour here, um, this was the position which it would have taken, which it, where it would have um, featured in the centre panel. Um, intriguingly, um, we'd seen two red painted areas in the bottom of this particular fragment, and we now know that they um, correspond to the legs of a missing French soldier. Um, an artist's visualization done during research in 2000 shows the approx approximate position and impression of this French soldier. So I'm hoping that's fairly clear in the bottom left. So you can see a sense at least of what would have been this trinity of death in the middle of uh, Kurtz's stupendous painting, stupendous triptych. Um, there would have been more barbed wire. Um, the soldier on the left had his intestines literally spilling out. This was, this um, artist's uh, visualization was based on a sketch that Fred Kurtz had produced in 2000. Um, <clears throat> which was rather rough and ready, but he recalled um, seeing the triptych and, and the fact that his father had used pig's intestines um, and had dumped them and placed them um, over a rather unwilling uh, a young model who had donned army uniform and had laid there holding, um, holding a broom, not a rifle, and with pig's intestines literally dumped on top of him. So this was quite an extreme um, way of getting the, the authenticity in this centre panel. A number of, of um, uh, sections of the triptych were photographed as I've described before, some printed as postcards and in this particular um, postcard um, dated, uh, let me see, um, um, uh, dated um, uh, December the 6th 1934 um, a year into uh, the Kurtz's exile, show that um, Kurtz was, was um, almost nearing completion of the, uh, the triptych, particularly concentrating on the previously described centre panel. So he's written to Siglinda, um, his young stepdaughter, who, by the way, um, had to stay behind uh, when, they, when they left um, Germany in the first instance, and would stay behind in 1937, after they left once again. Um, she was working as a nurse by this time, but she was able to send um, army braid uh, and uh, elements for Kurtz to uh, get the detail correct on the uniforms of his dead soldiers. And so the, 
the finely written text sent by uh, Kurtz, written by Kurtz, um, describes uh, receiving um, uh, the metal braid, but also um, entreating them to keep secret the whereabouts of the family. Um, he talks about um, uh, describing himself in the postcard as Uncle Hans, and Bershi was the nickname of Fred, and of course Mutti, mother too. Um, so this was an attempt to deflect suspicion. You can see now um, uh, a 2000 reconstruction of the triptych um, showing the positions of the surviving uh, fragments um, that uh, Ava had located during her searches in Germany in the 1980s. Um, the lower left two fragments you can see on the, le on the left hand panel are the ones that remain in Germany and the other colour fragments which you see above them in the centre panel and to the right are the ones which are now in the Leicester collections. Um, so again, it's hard to envision from this sm small image, but um, imagine uh, the size and power and splendor, uh, awful splendor of this triptych when it was first completed. So 1935, um, um, Kurtz produces um, a lovely pair, companion pair of portraits. On the left, a rather serious countenance wearing a splendid bow tie and with one of his life-size wooden sculptures of a stretching uh, nude girl in the background. On the right, uh, Claire wearing what we now know to be a, to be a wonderful burgundy um, headscarf and in the bottom left a richly tooled silver object, an intriguing object. Uh, which has a bracelet. It was actually a, um, uh, a wool holder. Uh, she loved to knit and to produce beautiful detailed embroidery. She was a keen singer and she was a wonderful player of chess. And every time she um, and Kurtz played together, she would almost invariably win. And this was based on both Ava's and uh, Fred's recollections writing in the later years. It's a wonderful pair of portraits from this time. And this is their, cottage, their home in the forest district of uh, Hohenbrunn. Um, this is um, a Voldeck, uh, which they had to leave so sadly, but Voldeck still uh, staying there, still, um, still there after so many years. And, and it was found um, untouched by Fred and Ava when they returned to Germany in the 1980s. Now, the awful task uh, which faced Kurtz in 1937 was his decision to destroy his triptych, to cut it up into what was believed to be 25 pieces. After the turning down of the commission um, um, that was offered by Heinrich Berg and Galeit of Wagner, Kurtz had gone to the Munich police headquarters to renew his visa um, for travel, but when he got there, he was summoned to the basement and he came face to face uh, with uh, a man who he thought he would never see again. This man was now an inspector in the secret state police. His name was Inspector Muller. In his army days, he was Corporal Muller, the man who, whose life Kurtz had saved in the trenches when uh, during the height of the Battle of Verdun, um, Kurtz and a group of other soldiers had been covered in rubble after a shell explosion. Kurtz had dragged Corporal Muller, who was still alive with a badly smashed leg, to safety and won the Iron Cross. And now he was face to face with the same man who had a peg leg. Muller uh, showed Kurtz a warrant for his arrest, immediate arrest on the charge of pacifist propaganda but told Kurtz um, he would keep it in a drawer for 48 hours. And this was the period that Kurtz used um, immediately on his departure from police headquarters to travel to the sawmill and helped by the man shown here, Andreas Knappich, uh, the son of the sawmill owner. Uh, Kurtz and Knappich used a sawmill 
um, to cut up the triptych into several pieces. These were hidden, um, helped by Siglinda, who we've talked about before, and um, these were uh, left behind when the family uh, left Germany, uh, escaping over the mountain border south of Munich in uh, Austria to Austria in August 1937. They reached Prague um, and after Innsbruck and uh, at a period of great difficulty um, found lodgings but Kurtz found uh, an ability to create portraiture and two postcard drawings survived from this time um, 19, both from 1938. On the left, a portrait of little Ava as a toddler wearing a lovely little bonnet. And on the right, St. Vaclav Church, um, uh, which was uh, the view uh, from their lodgings. So a wonderful modernist structure with factories in the distance. So perhaps an industrial district of Prague itself. Portrait of uh, Gräfin Schönborn. Um, one of the intelligentsia, one of the, uh, the higher up families in Prague. Um, Kultz was an exile who joined forces with, with um, other exiles in Prague at this time, including Margareta Klopfleisch, an emigre Dresden sculptor. Klopfleisch, Kultz and other artists um, took part in a project to present a folio of artworks to Edvard Benesch. And um, amongst the archive of Klopfleisch's family, who live in Leicestershire, there was discovered this photograph, um, a previously unknown accolade, showing that Kurtz was in fact involved in the Oskar Kokoschka Bund, active in Prague, um, uh, an artist's group led by Oskar Kokoschka. And it was from amongst this group that um, artists were selected and, inv and invited to um, create this wonderful portfolio. And we only have this photograph of the open page, um, which unfortunately is, is, is rather blurred, but halfway down, Kurtz's name appears. So it's an important historical discovery showing how he was active in spite of hardship in Prague. From Prague um, and given stateless pa passports for stateless people, emergency passports from the Czech authorities, uh, Colts managed to find his way onto um, a plane and flew out of um, uh, Prague to Rotterdam, um, where he was uh, de facto um, caged up. Um, not imprisoned, but with, with very limited movement at the Holland America Line Hotel, where many refugees who were lucky enough to have exit visas or money available were able to travel to America and other places in Europe. Uh, one of the portraits he produced at this time um, was uh, dated 1939 on a small plywood sheet, Rabbi Dr. Mayer. Um, we don't know the, uh, the story of uh, Rabbi Meir, um, but it's uh, a thoughtful, um, melancholy portrait. Um, the eyes of the rabbi witness to stories we will never know about, yet his face comes back at us through time. So it's a wonderful moment of reflection in a time which was, which was um, a time where families were torn apart, where uh, stories of horror were exchanged, but friendships were born nonetheless, and connections were made which survive today. Colts and his young family um, made it to England in April 1939. They initially uh, found a cottage in uh, Oxted in Surrey. Uh, called Ravensbrook, and this was where Kurtz and his family found initial solace. Uh, the family um, together, little Ava sitting on the knee of uh, Clara, Claire, and Clotilde, uh, Claire's stepdaughter, who had reached England by this time and had secured a job as a housekeeper at the Army College at Sandhurst in 1938. Uh, on the right is Eva Maria, um, a life-size little study of the toddler, um, dated 1939 in Poplarwood. 
but unfortunately uh, World War II broke out again and Colts' uh, rural cottage idyll and the family safety was uprooted once more because of um, internment. After Dunkirk and the, the fear of invasion, Parliament uh, introduced uh, hastily enacted legislation to, um, to initiate the internment of enemy aliens, um, able-bodied males between the ages of 16 and 60, um, were rounded up for internment and sent to various places, um, including Highton, um, the Isle of Man, Lingfield Racecourse, uh, and other, uh, other places, um, internment camps. And uh, the Dominions, um, Australia and Canada, were also um, drafted in, and Colts was sent to Australia on board Dunera, um, a troop ship, formerly a uh, passenger liner, co-opted for um, the voyage. The trip went down in infamy. Little is known about it um, uh, in the UK because of um, uh, embargoes, continuing embargoes on Home Office files around the encounter. Colts and over 2,000 mostly Jewish uh, uh, internees were sent to Australia on board Dunera and their six-week voyage going around the coast of Africa before Australia uh, went down in infamy for the rough treatment and looting they experienced from the ship's guard. Here we have a photograph in September 1940 published in the Sydney Morning Herald showing the disembarkation of the internees in a long straggling line going down off the, um, off the ship and boarding trains, which took them to two principal internment camps in the interior, um, a small town of, of Hay um, near the Murrumbidgee River um, was the site of two internment camps, the Hay Camp and the Tatura Camp, which housed um, the majority of the Jewish internees. Um, so these were camps seven and eight. Camp seven, the Hay Camp, was where Quilts found himself. And here we have a remarkable um, copy of uh, the camp currency, which was designed and printed by the internees and printed uh, at local publishers um, and used as ersatz uh, camp money. Um, the barbed wire border around the edge um, has a hidden inscription, we are here because we are here. Um, so there's no rhyme or reason for their internment um, protests were made to Parliament, attempts were made to seek redress for the looting that had gone on during the voyage. Um, but um, a sort of camp life behind barbed wire um, came to pass and Kurtz was a hut captain. There was a choir, art classes, um, recitals and sports recreation came to pass in the camps. Um, Kurtz was there himself for nine months, interned in Australia but eventually found his way back to the UK after the intercession of Major Julius Layton, who was sent by the English authorities over to Australia and managed to um, uh, gain compensation for the looting that had taken place. There was later a court martial in which certain officers and men of the Donera Guard were court martialed. Um, among the works produced by courts in Australia, uh, John the Baptist, a large eucalyptus carved log, um, whereabouts now unknown from 1941. This is a surviving sketch by Kurtz's fellow internee Klaus Friedeberger. On the right, uh, you can see a uh, Maori girl from 1941. Again, um, uh, eucalyptus wood, uh, a, a wonderful uh, flavour of Australian uh, New Zealand um, uh, tinged life. Um, Again, Colts only had um, hatchets, knives and razor blades as tools to use when he was carving, um, but nonetheless produced beautiful works like this. On, on his return, which was conditional on him joining the Pioneer Corps, he ended up initially training in Ilfracombe in Devon, which was the site of the, um, the Pioneer Corps training HQ and one of the portraits from around this time, 1942, was the refugee. So again, it uh, bears some of the qualities of the Neusachlichkeit painters. Uh, these refugees uh, weren't uh, hardened Nazis, they weren't even soldiers, they were estate agents, scientists, 
teachers, librarians, waiters, actors, artists, musicians, all gathered up and unjustly treated, uh, moved to uh, Australia or incarcerated behind barbed wire in places like the Isle of Man and uh, other centres. Um, and this refugee is perhaps bemused, bemusedly looking on the way his fate has turned on him and treated him. In 1943, Kurtz was um, stationed in Bista, uh, where he is shown here on the left sculpting, um, a lost large seven foot high sculpture of uh, a nude woman on the right, only surviving in a photograph. Uh, so the original work is unlocated. 1948, uh, Alpschwitz, a wonderful revisiting of the mountain landscapes which Kurtz had enjoyed as a young boy. So again, this is now in a collection in, in Ireland. Uh, 1952, um, an exhibition took place at Stafford uh, Library. Um, John Matthew Keltz uh, was Keltz's anglicised name and a portrait of his wife, Claire, from 1952. And in the, in the background on the left, you can see the painting on the right, which is Mellow Roses, painted in the same year, a collection of Claire's um, most favourite blooms. I'm moving quite swiftly now through, through the images because um, I'm conscious of time. Um, Albina Newland, um, the widow of Fritz Newland, um, a compadre from Pioneer Corps days, um, welcomed Kultz as a, a companion and the two found um, a, a wonderful companionship together after the death of Claire Kultz in 1957. Um, Albina is shown here on, on the left, um, uh, again a wonderful companion to Kultz um, who died in 1971 of throat cancer and um, the year before the portrait, the self-portrait on the right was his, um, his final self-portrait. Again, um, still observant, uh, still um, uh, rigorous in his treatment of himself, holding a brush. And once again, a reminder of the, <clears throat> um, the fragments which Ava had discovered in the 1980s. Uh, she went to, uh, back to Germany accompanied by uh, Fred Kurtz, um, who had left the family in Oxted and uh, taken his own path as a very young man. Um, he'd gone to work in Oxted and found a career as a mechanic working in a small aviation company making aircraft parts for the duration of the war. He stayed in Oxted where he met and married um, not once but twice. His surviving um, widow uh, Anne um, gave us some wonderful details of his life in Oxted. So it was Fred who helped Ava in returning to Germany and it was where they discovered surviving fragments which um, were given to, to, uh, to Ava. Um, not in this case, the fragments you see, the colour fragments, were ones that she'd seen and discovered in the village of, of Wolfratshausen where a retired German dentist was the figure of the child um, who'd modelled for courts so long ago. This is the opening of, this is the last few slides, I should say, the opening of the paint box, which um, uh, had been guarded and treasured by Albina Newland, um, Kurtz's latter companion, seen on the left, um, looking on as Ava Farrington and Albina's son, Tim, um, opened the paint box to reveal uh, precious documents that Ava had been searching for. This was 1993. When Ava gave the fragments that she owned to the museum, a worldwide appeal was launched to search for the missing fragments and the patron was Lord Attenborough. So in 1998, here he is, having come to the museum and met Ava and seeing the triptych fragments for the first time. So wonderfully able patron and a worldwide search was made, but sadly no further fragments were discovered. Finally, and the last slide, uh, a wonderful uh, colorized digital reconstruction of Kurtz's amazing triptych was made by Daryl Joyce, uh, commissioned for the BBC's Inside Out program, screened originally in 2012. 
So uh, a wonderful envisioning, which gives us a much more clear imagining of Coltz's lost masterpiece and what it would have originally looked like. So that, because uh, time is moving on, um, brings me to a close. And I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to uh, Coltz's story. Uh, much more detail, of course, in my book, The Painter's Hidden Masterpiece. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, Simon. That was absolutely tremendous, totally fascinating and terribly moving. I mean, goodness me. Um, fine, let's, um, perhaps, would you like to stop screen sharing and then you can be seen more fully on the screen as people ask questions. Um, please do type in any questions or comments you may have. Um, very good. Perhaps I can set the ball rolling. I know there are already a few, but let's just hold fire for a moment with my art historian's hat on. Um, it strikes me immediately that unlike many of the artists condemned as so-called degenerate by the Nazis, in other words, expressionistic essentially in their handling of paint and their slovenly approach to technique as it was perceived by the Nazis, Kurtz is completely the opposite, isn't he? I mean, he actually has that old master kind of skill that the Nazis so very much approved of. And there is that kind of real irony at work here, isn't there? That he actually, had he not chosen to take, take this profoundly anti-war stance, he could indeed have thrived had he chosen to, yeah, in the Third Reich. And I wonder if you have anything more to say about that? I think that's true. Um, a number of um, uh, writers and historians have, have looked on Kurtz's career and perhaps had he stayed in, in Germany, um, he would have pursued um, what might be described as an aesthetic conservatism. Um, I think though he would have uh, quickly um, uh, run foul of the Nazis simply because as Ava, his daughter, um, remarked over many years, he was um, a very cussed, um, bloody minded soul. And he would have um, got into arguments with, with all sorts of people on the grounds of what he should paint and why he should paint it. So I think perhaps, I don't know, it's, it is true to say that his style is, is um, uh, realist with, with a, a slight conservative element, but he did produce um, uh, some wonderful um, uh, new objectivity tinged portraits and of course the triptych which was um, a painted repudiation of war, which of course would have made him an enemy of the Nazis uh, in no uncertain terms. Absolutely. Um, I do have quite a few other questions, but I'm seeing the other people's questions come rolling in, so I think I must give priority to them. Um, uh, do apologize if I'm peering at my little screen and my main computer crashed and I'm having to make two with a rather small screen, which is uh, hampering me somewhat. Um, okay, let's um, take them perhaps as, as well, okay. Um, Penelope um, Loughton saying, I'd be interested to hear about any precursors to Thou Shalt Not Kill. That's to say, was Kurtz creating works on similar topics um, prior to this? Now, I think in a way you've answered that, but maybe one could, um, I could add to that. I mean, one thing that, not as an art historian, but as a human being, I suppose, I'm also very intrigued by in his major work, The Triptych, Thou Shalt Not Kill, is the position of faith in that extraordinary work. Is it conventionally a, rel a religious work? And if not, why not? Well, why not actually? It's fairly obvious because clearly the war stripped him of his faith and he said as much, didn't he? But you see what I'm saying? That he actually uses a triptych format, doesn't he? Uh, which is archetypally, you know, sort of conventional and yet completely subverts it. And I was also struck going back to Penelope's question that the images you've shown us of his work prior to that were actually indeed quite conventional. There was the one of the soldiers um, with the priest. You know, this was actually an image of solace, wasn't it? Whereas the triptych emphatically is not. Um, there's also a related question from Christine Battersby. Uh, thank you, fantastic. Um, but who's the white haired man in the right of Thou Shall Not Kill and also in the postcard? Um, yes, yeah, so maybe you'd like to sort of tackle um, that specific question, but also this bigger yeah, question. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> unfortunately, when, when uh, Kurtz uh, left um, and fled Germany uh, on the second occasion in August 1937, um, it is believed, um, according to family testimony, that he destroyed um, a lot of papers and drawings and sketches. Um, it is possible that... Um, he may have produced um, other sketches and drawings 
Um, but because of the contentious nature of thou shalt not kill, possibly supporting studies um, were either hidden or destroyed. The fragments um, that he left behind were hidden um, and the postcards he produced were uh, necessarily not of the centre panel but of, of uh, portrait groups such as um, uh, praying women, children and of course the, the soldiers. Um, I think the, the, um, the Johannes Earl Commission, the, the book publication which was commissioned by his friend Heinrich Berg, um, certainly shows um, some aspects, um, further, illust uh, further illustrations not only the the communion in in on the front, but um, a military uh, hospital um, in a church building, and uh, also other examples of of soldiers um, receiving uh, the ministry of, of of God and so on. There's an element of of quiet subversion in those illustrations, but a more powerful one in the triptych. The the flanking um, panels. Um, certainly demonstrate a, a very traditional realist outlook, but it's the centre panel that almost repudiates um, the faith that's shown on those, those wings, those side panels, in the horror of death that he shows. So, so there's a certain sense of, of perhaps conservatism that, that is turned on its head with the power of his triptych. So other works may exist which support that, but unfortunately, um, they're few and far between. Thank you, Simon. I actually have a very specific question relating to all that. I was struck by a certain affinity between the central motif and there's a, a George Gross, um, it was a, a drawing turned into a print, if I'm right, from the early 20s called Christ with Gas Mask. And I wonder if you came across any uh, link between the two. I wonder whether he would have known about it because that was utterly subversive of the comfort of, of, of the crucifixion image. I think Kurtz would would have uh, would have um, <clears throat> had a certain um, grim satisfaction from following um, the, the 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 actions of certain of the uh, new objectivity painters and their commentary. Um, George Gross uh, produced um, prints on sale to discerning collectors in gallery settings, but he also produced. Um, small magazines uh, packed with satirical, very pointed illustrations. And uh, there was a trial, of course, in, in uh, 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 just before uh, Gross was forced to uh, emigrate to America in 1933, a blasphemy trial in which his print of a gas mask soldier uh, was, was held up as, as um, an example of, of new objectivity decadence and, and resulted in uh, Gross being heavily fined and, and ultimately sent on his way. Um, so Colts, I'm sure, would have would have seen that. He it's believed he he would have made an effort to see the Dix um, painting the trench when it came in a touring exhibition of the artist's work to Munich, and um, <coughs> he would also have been aware of of other works which um, produced a key a key influence on him. <coughs> including um, uh, Matthias Grunewald's um, great um, uh, triptych showing Christ as a diseased, um, uh, crucified um, figure covered in plague-like sores. Um, so this was a very, very powerful uh, work which was brought by the, the German authorities uh, to Munich for a while. And it was seen as an almost cathartic image uh, in front of which uh, disabled uh, veterans were, were wheeled, almost to, almost to to absorb the, the the radiance of faith which came came upon it. So Kurtz would have been aware of of the kind of reverence that that painting had. So these different strands would have informed his thinking as he conceived of his own triptych. Absolutely, uh, some rich rich threads indeed. I have a question here about his sculpture because I was also struck by the consummate skill with which he created works in three dimensions from Neil Ogden who says several images were shown in the presentation of sculptors, sculptures made after he left Germany. Did he practice sculpture earlier in his life in Germany or was it something he practiced only after he left that country? I think when he was enrolled in the, um, the Munich Academy of Fine Arts he would have received formal instruction across a range of disciplines. So probably 
the his his skill in in sculpture would have would have perhaps come to the fore then and perhaps he, he may have been interested in producing sculpture in the the forest district with such a rich supply of uh, of wood um so he could he could use it and of course in the in the um uh, the internment camp in Australia, uh, he used the eucalyptus trunks and logs, which were used as an endless source of free free firewood. So, yes, yeah, so his formal skills were were very strong, and his desire to um, have sculpture as part of his practice um, was certainly notable. Thank you. And um, shifting the focus somewhat, a question from Jilly Allenby. Um, how does Simon know that Kiltz's freedom was conditional on, leaning, on, on joining the Pioneer Corps? In other words, to, yes, to sort of uh, uh, cease being interned uh, to become part of the Pioneer Corps. And does he know which company he joined? Very specific question. There. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, Helen Fry, um, an author, produced um, uh, a book called Jews in North Devon. Um, uh, an early history of the Pioneer Corps and its foundation. Uh, Ilfracombe in Devon um, was the, the the principal training centre for the Pioneer Corps, and um, Major Julius Layton, who came and visited um, the Hay Camp in Australia and the Tatura Camp, um, sent by um, by the Home Office in England, um, <clears throat> made the offer, the conditional offer, um, on behalf of the uh, of the English government that um, internees uh, would be given free passage back to the UK on condition that they, they joined up and became members of the, the Pioneer Corps, uh, which was seen as free labour, really, I guess you might say. So, so it was, it was a, a carrot and stick um, approach. Um, again, some of the, 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 um, the way in which the internees were thrown together and the mixing of memories and individuals created a, a, an incredible atmosphere in, in uh, real um, hardship and um, displacement and loss during, during this time. So courts would have seen that, would have made friends and painted the portraits of um, his fellow internees at this time. So yes, yeah, so going back to the, 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 the questioner, um, it was, it was a, a, a condition which was put forward through Julius Layton um, the, 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 the dignitary who'd come to the camps on behalf of the government, who were trying to undo the, 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 the very, very messy situation they'd got themselves into by sending these poor, these poor men abroad in the first place. I think you could be very cynical and say, yes, it was a way of getting cheap labour for you know, the British war effort. But I think also you can see the other side of the coin. And that is that, of course, the refugees very much wanted to fight the Nazis. And actually, by joining the Pioneer Corps, that was one way yeah, yeah. they could do it. Um, I'm aware of the time. It's nearly half past. I think, sadly, we must draw things to a close, Simon. That really has been a wonderful session. And there have been all sorts of lovely, appreciative comments coming in the chat uh, function. Um, perhaps I can just end by picking up on this issue of internment, which uh, is a very fascinating and, I think, still problematic one uh, by saying that, as some of you may know, this is this 2020 is the 80th anniversary of that first internment, you know, sort of episode in 1940. And there have been a whole lot of events about that, including quite a few held under the auspices of the Insiders Outsiders Festival. And I would urge those of you who are intrigued by this topic to look at the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel that you can find very easily simply by doing a Google search for it. And in fact, as it happens rather serendipitously, the last two events of the current series of online events are tomorrow and they are both on the theme of internment. Uh, we had one just a few days ago on internment in Canada, the Arundora Star as a kind of notorious counterpart to the Dunera story, both utterly shocking. But the two tomorrow are specifically about the Isle of Man. And uh, one of them is by Yvonne Cresswell, who's the archivist, the social history curator at the Manx National Heritage. And she'll be talking about the rich archival resources mm -hmm. in the on the Isle of Man. And the second one, uh, last but not least one might say, is specifically about the experience of the women internees. And I'm glad that you mentioned Margareta Klopfleisch because as Simon certainly knows, and some of you may also know, she was indeed one of the women who ended up interned on the south, the southern tip of the Isle of Man and actually had a pretty traumatic uh, time there. So it all begins, you know, it sort of all comes together. So please do, uh, there's still plenty of space. If you'd like to sign up for those, please do on the Insiders Outsiders um, website. So once more, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for your comments. Again, more appreciative comments, Simon, coming in. And what an extraordinary story and 
I've read the book. If you want to find out more, Simon, the best way is to go to your website. Am I right? To yes, yes that's right. Simon um, Lake. Simonlake.co.uk. Very good. And you can get it from Simon. It's a, it's a wonderful and very poignant and fascinating read. So good night, everybody, and all the very best. Thank you very much.